All right. If you have your Bibles, open up to the book of Luke. <clears throat> We're going to be in chapter 16. <clears throat> Lordy, I thank you very much for the throat lozenge. It's helping me not cough, but man, this thing has got awful. <laughs> We're going to start chapter 16, verse 1. We're going to read through a little bit. We're going to discuss today a passage that I have not heard taught on to my recollection. Okay? Now it's interesting, there are a couple of verses in here that I've heard taught on quite a bit. But never in the context of the passage in which it's used. So Luke chapter 16, starting in verse 1. He also said to the disciples, now we got to back up right there because we've, we've got a question, who's he? Jesus. The way we know that is we back up to the previous chapter and we see that Jesus was talking to them. And so 16 is just a continuation. He says, He also said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager. And charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? He said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of the world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of life. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you with the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now we are several weeks into our series on money matters. What's the first thing we need to know about money? It's God's. All of it. Not the 10% that you hear so often you have to give to the church. You know, you got to give God back His 10%. No. He lets you keep 90. It's His. Paul tells us that everything you have, you have been given. Why then do you act as though you did not receive it? You brag and you boast. But it's God that's given it to you. So the, the first principle we need to understand when it comes to money... Mammon, actually the word used here in uh, 
verse 13, is mammon. And mammon carries the idea not just of money, but of your stuff. Okay? Your possessions. Unfortunately, in America, we've got a lot of Christians that are possessed by their possessions. There is no plainer way that Jesus can say to us what he's saying than how he said it. Okay? You cannot have two masters. You will serve either God or you will serve money. And if money is your master and you're putting money on the throne of your life, then God is not there. And you're worshiping a false god. You're worshiping a created thing rather than the creator. So the first thing we understand is that it's all his. Okay? Which makes us what? Stewards. Stewards. Okay? We're not owners. We're stewards. We're like the manager. You notice in this, this parable there's, there's a cast of characters that, that fill three roles. There's the owner. Now in, this, in this parable, who's the owner? God. Okay? Then there's the manager. Who do you suppose is the manager? Ooh. Okay, hold on to that thought. And then there's the workers. Okay? Now, we talked about whose it is. Last week, the two previous weeks, we talked about how important it is to God, how you get it. We looked at Proverbs 13 and talked about building a little by a little. And we understand that of the 270 verses that are instructional value concerning money, almost 90 of them deal with how you acquire it. Okay? Now, I, I have not found all of these verses. But conservative scholars say that there's about 2,000 verses in the Scripture that deal with money. Others say there's as many as 2,700. Well, a lot of that is dependent on how you interpret a particular passage. But of those that deal with instructional issues, we have about 270. Do you think money is an important issue to God? Not really. He owns it all. But he understands that it's a critical issue for us. Okay? He understands that we will worship those things that we think give us happiness. And there's this great delusion in America that money and the stuff that it gets you will make you happy. But does it really? Because see, as soon as we get object X, whatever that is for you, we then move on to clamoring for object Y. Well, if I just had this, I would be happy. And you get that, but now you want the other. Okay? So, we talked a little bit about how we acquire. We talked about honest work. <clears throat> that there's this idea that pervades our society that you have to have a job that fulfills you. That completes you. Look, the nature of work since the fall of man is that it stinks. It's a toil. It's a labor. Okay? And, and I, was, I had the uh, pleasure of talking with a gentleman at the Creamery Picnic yesterday, and he was sharing with me that he spent um, 22 plus years working for the Postal Service. And when he retired, he retired from uh, the post office. And, and um, we were talking about the fact that you don't see many people that stay in one employment place that long anymore. We also talked about the fact that 
You don't see many companies that make it worth you staying. What a disappointment that is. This week, I want to talk to you about how you use it. Okay, we talked about we understand it's God's. At least you should understand that it's God's. We talked about how you go about gathering it. This, this uh, lie of instant wealth. We talked about those that have won the lottery and within a matter of months or years are right back where they started from, dead broke, bankrupt. How instant wealth tends to disappear like a vapor. But that scripture commends us to build it slowly, piece by piece, little by little. So we've talked about, we read the passage about the, the dishonest manager. Does anybody, has anybody read this and been kind of bothered by the fact that Jesus commended him? That the owner commended the dishonest manager? Does that bother you? See, what, one of the ways that we need to look at this passage is we need to look at this as though it's us. And, and what we see here is God's grace. Because see, what the manager did was sin, wasn't it? Now, now, the way that it was set up, if I understand this right, this was very similar to how the tax collectors worked. The owner hired a man to look after his possessions, to look after his fields. And when the crops were ready, he was to go to each of the farmers and he was going to say, okay, you know, your master's share is X. And then he could add to that his portion on behalf of working for the master. And that was how he made his living. So if this guy owed 50 bushels a week, he could tell the guy, well, you owe 60, and he would take the 10 for himself. Okay? But we see something going on here that, that obviously something is out of kilter, something is not right, because the word gets back to the owner, hey, This guy's robbing you. He's not keeping his books are a little, little flaky. Anybody remember Zacchaeus? The wee little man? The wee little man was he? What did he do? Climbed up in a tree so that he could see Jesus. Jesus came. And this man had an encounter with the living God. And his sin was revealed to him, wasn't it? And when, when he was confronted with his sin, what did he do? Okay, come on. Say it loud. If you get it wrong, everybody will laugh. Don't worry. <laughs> See, they're laughing now. He went and made it right. He went and made it right, but did he just pay him back what he owed him? He paid back twice. Anybody that he had wronged, he paid back twice. Now you do the math on this. Zacchaeus is going to be in debt. Because everything that he had, above and beyond what he was allowed, was robbery, wasn't it? And now he's got to pay back twice to everybody. Now, that's not something Jesus commanded him, was it? No, he did that because of the change in his heart. Alright? So we have this manager. He's cooking the books a little. The owner finds out what's going on and he calls the manager in. Anybody picture Donald Trump right here? What's he say? You're fired! Get out of here! Well, he didn't quite do that. He said, you need to settle accounts and then you're gone. Now, the manager, he's in trouble, isn't he? Think about this from the perspective that he has been robbing the people that have been bringing their, their goods to him to pay the master. Okay, These are the people that he knows. This is the community in which he lives. And while he's 
all fat and happy. Yeah. Yeah. He's getting the abundance. And these yeah. people are, are seeing their hard work going down his gullet. Yeah. And now he's without a job. Wow. I am not strong enough to dig. Obviously, Jesus didn't have a lot of respect for this guy. <laughs> I'm not strong enough to dig. And I'm ashamed to beg. I'm ashamed to beg. So this is what I'll do. I'm going to need friends. I'm going to need people that will welcome me and not turn me out. So what am I going to do? What does he do? What is the significance of marking down what they owe? See, for a long time I'm thinking, why is the owner happy? He just got ripped off even more. This guy owed him 100 He's only paying 50 This guy owed him 100 He's only paying 80 No, that's not what he's doing. What he's doing is he is marking off what they owe him. And if you look at the exorbitant amount that he was charging them, you owe the master 50 You owe me an additional 50 Now, we have to understand that there was probably some more shenanigans going on than this because the master accuses him of not keeping accurate accounts. So, I think what he's doing is he's telling these people, hey, you owe the master 100 He really owes the master 50 but he tells the master they didn't have enough this time, so they only gave you 40 <laughs> And he's walking off with 60 and he's making every bit as good or better than the master, isn't he? So, here he is. Master comes in to pay a skew. <laughs> What's this I hear? You're fired. Settle the accounts. Get out of here. Now, the man goes. Now, this is something that, that I want to kind of look at this illustration in terms of grace. Okay? Because really, while this deals on one level with money and how we do and use money, on a deeper level, on a much richer level, I think this is all about God's grace. Okay? See, the, the, the owner is not commending the manager for his sin. That's ludicrous, right? Ridiculous. Why would he commend him for ripping him off? But what the manager does is he humbles himself. See, look at this. I'm too ashamed to beg. Isn't that pride? Yeah. And see, isn't pride what gets us into so much trouble? Isn't pride what causes us to do those things that we know we shouldn't do and then be afraid to humble ourselves to make it right? But what we, we really think we're impressing people? I am without sin. Read 1 John. No, you're not. We have this understanding, we have this idea that, you know, we fear the judgment of the church. And, and sometimes, quite honestly, that's, that's an appropriate fear because I've, I've read about how some churches handle things. And, and there is not much grace. There is not much love. There's just hardship and anger and, and, and punishment. The, the, the end result of all discipline should be restoration, shouldn't it? To, to put back in a right relationship? To make things right? I mean, what is this with, with the, just the heaping on of punishments without ever restoring? So, the manager, he's got to humble himself. But man, he humbles himself in an incredible way. Because he's already been caught. The master knows what he did. His sin has been exposed. But he goes to each of those that he has robbed. 
And he makes things right. He comes to the one and he says, what do you owe? I owe a hundred measure of oil. Take it. Mark 50. Why 50? Because that's what he really owed. That extra 50? He didn't know that. That was the manager's dishonesty. He goes to the next. How much do you owe? 100 measures of wheat. Well, market is 80. Why? He's not robbing the owner. He is setting things right. But imagine the humility that it takes for him to go to each one of those that he has robbed and probably robbed ongoing for years and correct his mistake. So this is one of those things that, that in the church I think we fail at miserably. When sin is exposed, we, we tend to fall into one of two camps on either extreme. On the one, we whip them and scourge them and, and end up driving them out of the church. Or on the other, we, oh, it's okay, sweetheart, you just sweet little thing, you love, 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 pat, 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 everything's okay. We don't deal with sin the way it needs to be dealt with. See, it's always a matter of restoration. It's always to return them to a right relationship. But so often we make light of sin, don't we? Oh, it's no big deal. You ever catch someone gossiping? Do you know that's one of the things that the scriptures say God hates? He detests it. And how often I've heard gossip couched in the phrase of a prayer request. We need to pray for this poor son. Because they did this and this and this and this and this and this and this. And, this. and can you believe what they've done? Oh, we definitely need to be praying for that person. Okay, shut up and pray. Right? Right? Because I don't need to know all the gory details of the measure of their sin to pray for them. God knows. God understands. God knows full well. He doesn't need me to describe it for Him. So he humbles himself and he goes and he starts to make things right. This is like that moment of salvation where our sin is exposed and we know it. And we have to humble ourselves. And sometimes we have to go to those we've sinned against and we need to make things right. I want to share with you a sin that I committed this week. <gasps> Pastor committed a sin. Yeah. I do. So do you. That's what makes His grace so marvelous. We had Christopher and Kayla's, two of their children with us this week, Titus and Annalisa. And I love my grandchildren with all my heart, but they're exhausting. And, and we got to have, the same day we delivered them back to Christopher, we picked up Judah and Declan and Isla and brought them home. And, and it's not so much that, that they're exhausting because they're bad. They're kids. And kids have energy. And they want to explore and see and touch and taste everything. <laughs> and so we had uh, been dealing with, with just the, and, and Titus and Annalisa, I love them, but they talk. <laughs> and they talk and, they, and, and they're not content for you to just occasionally grunt you have to engage you have to participate and when Titus is playing he wants to carry an ongoing dialogue with you about what he's playing Papa look the dinosaurs get in the guy in the car uh, Papa look Papa pa and then he brings him over he puts him on my lap and plays in my lap so I will know what's going on well, all the while, he's actually playing. Annalisa does not play. Annalisa talks. <laughs> See, I thought, 
I was delivered of this when Mackenzie got married and moved out. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. And, and she requires that you respond, but not only that you respond, but that you respond in an intelligent manner, as though you actually understand what she's talking about. Which means, you have to pay attention. It's exhausting. <laughs> but God has given me more grace as I get older. Maybe it's meds. I don't know. But I remember telling Mackenzie, you need to stop talking. You're making me tired. <laughs> You're motoring. It's just like, you know, you, you pull the string and it just goes forever. Stop. Just stop. Well, we had been dealing with this for several days, and, and uh, those of you that know Christy, she does not like to cook. To put it mildly. She has an agreement with Mackenzie that once a week, Christy will iron all of Mackenzie's clothes, and Mackenzie will cook for us. Works out great for me, I still get to eat. <laughs> me and Josh think it's a great deal. We're fed, good, good deal. Okay? So Christy does not like to cook. And, and we had stuff going on and I was distracted. There were things that I was trying to get ready for, for ministry this week and, and Christy had made a, a meal for us and we sat down and through the entire course of the meal, um, I whined, I cried. And I, I was not thankful. I was not appreciative. I, I spoke uh, uh, with great offense toward her because the meal was something that I really didn't care for. And, you know, the, the, I just, I, I, was, I was not, I, was, I, 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 I sinned. I spoke harshly. I was not appreciative. I was not thankful. And after we were done eating, God really kind of, kind of took that pin and pinned me to the wall. You know, does God do that to you ever? You know, he pins you to the wall and then turns that bright light on you and, and allows you to replay everything, but as he sees it, not as you see it. And, and he doesn't listen to your excuses. But God, I was tired. God, did you not see what I had to put up with with Annalisa? <laughs> I love her to death, but God, could you just tone her, dial her down? No, let's stick to the topic here. Look, look how you act. Look what you did. And I, I had to go to Christy, and I had to repent, and, and I had to ask her forgiveness, because I did not treat her as she deserved to be treated, especially knowing that she does not like to cook in the first place, and she made a meal for us, and... She had all the busy stuff to do that I was doing. Because they bounce from person to person. And they want everybody included. They're not selfish. Everybody needs to listen. <laughs> and so I sinned. And I needed to go and I needed to make it right. Now, I could have just acknowledged my sin before God. I could have confessed. I could have repented. But even though the sin was first against God... It was also against Christy. And I had a responsibility to go to her and to repent before her as well. To, to acknowledge that what I had done was wrong and to make it right. We had a rule in our household that nobody was allowed to complain about the meal until mom did. And if mom did not complain about the meal, nobody complained about the meal. If mom complained about the meal, we ordered pizza. <laughs> and the kids would always watch me. And I would watch Christy. <laughs> she's eating it. She's frowning, she's frowning, she's, she's, oh, she's still eating. All right, kids, this is what's for dinner. <laughs> because she works hard, especially knowing how much she dislikes being in the kitchen. She works hard to serve us. And so we need to honor that. So, back to this. Wow. All right. Next week, I want to talk to you about shrewdness. Look down here. 
Verse 8. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. So you have homework this week. Come up with a working definition for shrewdness. Okay? So next week when we're talking about shrewdness, we can all be on the same page and understanding what this passage is talking about. Okay? So homework is? Find shrewdness. Next week we're going to go into this. Um, we're going to look at this, this passage that comes a little bit later when he's talking about the sons of the world. We're going to look at... Um, unrighteous wealth and what Jesus talks about, what that means. So um, hold on to your hats because we're going to be talking about money, but we're going to be talking about the deeper issue because everything that Jesus talked about always pointed us back to God. Alright? Whether he was telling stories about fishermen, farmers, Pharisees, everything that he did was always pointing us back to God. We need to remember that. Okay, so as we talk about money and how God wants us to see money, we need to understand it's always with the position that it's pointing us back to God. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. We thank you that you have gifted us with your promised Holy Spirit that will teach us, that will illuminate to us what we need to know, that guides us into the richness of your word. And I ask, Lord God, that you would continue to open our ears and our eyes, that we would see and hear what you would say to us, that we would understand, Father, that we would endeavor to seek out the richness of your word. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.